بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على النبي الأمي برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين الله أكبر the Sahabi that we learn about is such a great individual he was known as the Khatib of Quraysh he was one of those that Allah's Nabi wished for their hidayah Allah's Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم wanted hidayah for humanity and at times he would mention certain people's names and say that such and such and so and so I wish hidayat for this individual I hope that Allah help this individual turn away from shirk and bring him to Islam on one occasion Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned four men consecutively arba'atam min Quraysh arghabu bihim an shirk that I desire for them that they turn away from ascribing partners unto Allah. I wish this for them. I hope of this for them. And I desire Islam for them. I hope he died for them. وَأَرْغَبُ لَهُمْ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ O Nabi of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sahaba asked, Which four are you referring to? Allah's Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, Hazrat Attab ibn Usaid, and Hazrat Jubair ibn Mut'im, and Hazrat Hakim ibn Hizam and Hazrat Suhail ibn Amr and Allahu Akbar what happened to these individuals that Allah's Nabi wished Hidayat for them from here let's learn a lesson that we think of someone for example let's make dua of Hidayat for them we meet someone in our workplace in our day to day lives our neighbors, colleagues, teachers employers, employees Spare a dua for them. The believer's dua is accepted. Allah says in numerous verses of the Quran Kareem, O my bando, Udu'uni astajib lakum, ask of me, pray to me, I guarantee your response. Allah Akbar, Allah will grant the believer. The other ayat of the Quran mentions, Fayakshifu ma tad'una ilayhi in shah. Here Allah says, Allah will remove the harm that is facing you when you make dua for him, if he wills. So how do we combine and understand the two verses? Here Allah promises his, his, the, the response of his dua. Here Allah says, according to his will. In the first verse, the believer is meant. Allah guarantees the acceptance of the dua of the believer. And in the second instance, the non-believer is referred to. That Allah answers his prayer as well. But when Allah wills. But the believer's prayer and the acceptance of the prayer of the believer is accepted on certain occasions. Yes, number one, he doesn't ask Allah something concerning breaking ties. And the other is he doesn't pray regarding certain sinful things, sinful practices, wrong actions. If he, what he asks is halal, Allah will bless him with that. Imagine asking Allah for the next person's hidayah. In that we will be emulating Allah's Nabi's sunnah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Wishing hidayat for humanity Aspiring for humanity's hidayah Sometimes Allah forbid Allah save us We wrongfully admire someone Someone who might Excel in something Let's make dua for their hidayat Obviously we shouldn't be admiring people In incorrect avenues But what we can do is Ask Allah to give them hidayah because they are also the ummatis of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And many a time, no one had ever invited them to Islam or afforded that them that opportunity. Just yesterday I meet these few brothers at a garage. And I asked them, you know my friends, have you ever heard these words? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. They said, yes we have. Then I asked, do you, ever, did you, do you know what it means? What, what, what these words mean? They said, we don't. So I said, did you ever think of asking? He said, we wondered and we wanted to ask, but really we haven't. So I, in humor, said to them, that you hear something you don't know. Isn't it important for you to ask? So in, in humor, they responded, yes, we should have asked. So explaining the adhan to them, and the beautiful meaning, they were elated. And few others came in to the store, and the one is telling the other, did you, did you know that what does the adhan mean? The meaning is so pleasant. So Allah, he just heard the meaning of the adhan. As a non-Muslim, he's explaining to another, yeah, you also heard this, this is what it means. And the meaning is so beautiful, they are telling each other. 
So yes, we can wish for humanity's hidayah. A believer's dua is accepted. Either Allah will grant him what he wishes, or Allah will give him something better than that, or Allah will remove some harm coming his way, or Allah will invest his prayer for him and grant it to him when he needs it most in the hereafter. Here we have one brother in Darul Ulum who started attending not long ago. He comes from Switzerland. And he was narrating his amazing report to us. Wherein, in his depression and his worry, he phoned a friend of his, asking him what to do. So his friend says to him, come. And it so happened, alhamdulillah, that his friend Paul started attending salah in the masjid. And he had just embraced Islam. So Paul takes him to the masjid. And alhamdulillah, it happened that there was a jamaat from Pakistan in that masjid that they went to. He says, we entered the masjid, there were brothers sitting in the masjid, and there was a program taking place. He says, later I got to learn that that program was called the Darmiyani program. The Darmiyani talk. Meaning, whilst the brothers are out on meeting brothers, inviting them to Allah, there are others who sit in the masjid, learning something of deen. So between the two programs, there is something called Darmiyani, the program in between the two. Where others who might join or come to the masjid, after the brothers have departed, have something to learn. Or as they meet others and they want to join in the programs, they may come to the masjid and sit. So he said, I sat for this program. It was really inspirational. In this, by the time it was the Isha prayer, I was ready to embrace Islam. And in that, the brothers returned from the visits, the mulaqat, the meetings, meeting people for Allah. And as they noticed that I was about to recite the shahada, quite a few of them were emotioned by this and teared. And I embraced Islam, prayed with them. A brother, the Jamaat was going, the brothers were going, were going for three days. I joined them. And whilst out on this beautiful travel, I mustered up the courage and asked the one that, uh, you know, the brothers cried as they attended or as they arrived at the masjid the night I was reciting the Shahada. So he explained that the reason for that was that we were out meeting brothers for Allah. And sometimes in Switzerland, it takes long to get from one place to another. And by the time you get to someone, Many a time he will welcome you, but sometimes a person becomes derogatory, becomes disrespectful, or says to us, you know, get lost, don't you have anything else to do, we are busy. So brothers were was somehow insulted, and they were disheartened by this. So some of the brothers said to the Amir, the leader of the group, saying, that you know, this is a waste of time. If we had to sit in the masjid and, uh, you know, carried on in our optional prayers and ibadah and remembrance of Allah, it would have been more beneficial to us instead of coming to people who really don't want us. The Amir said, don't say that. This work of meeting brothers for Allah, rejuvenating reju each other's iman, worrying about each other's deen, connecting each other to Allah is such an important work, such a great and noble task and work of every Nabi. That through this, you're making effort somewhere. Allah is giving hidayah to someone somewhere else. And Allah is rewarding us for it. Or Allah will bring a non-Muslim to Islam. That's how special this work is. The Amir uttered this and we were thinking, what is he saying? As we return to the masjid and we see, it was just then that you were about to recite the shahada. It inspired us that never complain about this work and never feel we are going to meet a brother for Allah. We are wasting time. Allahu Akbar, our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to Ta'if. Went to Ta'if. What was the reaction of the people of Ta'if? They insulted. They hurt. They dejected. They rejected Allah's Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He bled and he gave du'as. Years later, as an amazing hadith I learned recently, Allah's Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam met these brothers and he says to him, How is your mother? Ruqayqa was her name, a thaqafiya So they mentioned that she's well. Allah's Nabi said, How is her deen? They said, O Nabi of Allah, she left this world in, in a manner that she was believing in Allah and His Rasul. And this hadith actually, this incident, what, what happened here was, when Allah's Nabi was in Ta'if, this elderly lady was among the among the few, she was like the only one who welcomed Allah's Nabi. She gave him barley to eat. And she embraced Islam and she asked him advice. And amongst the advisors, Allah's Nabi said, Never submit to idolatry, never submit to creation, never worship taghiyah, the, the idols, and so forth. So the sons are saying to Allah's Nabi, Yes, our mother maintained the teachings she learned from you. So Allahu Akbar, Allah's Nabi went to Ta'if. We might think, What was the reaction? What was the insult? But Allah gave somebody hidayat. Allah gave this elderly woman hidayat. 
as Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was returning, Allah gave hidayah to the jinn. I was reading about this sahabi, Hazrat Amr bin Jabir al-Jinni radiallahu anhu. What happened here was, Hazrat Safwan bin Mu'attal, Safwan bin Mu'attal radiallahu anhu. He was that sahabi radiallahu anhu, who found Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha, when she was left behind on the expedition of Mustaliq. She went looking for the amana of her sister, her sister's necklace. And while she had gone, the Sahaba radiallahu departed already because she had returned and then she went again realizing that her sister's necklace was missing. And when she returned to the camp, there was no one left there. Instead of going helter-skelter, in her wisdom, our mother radiallahu said, Allah's Nabi will send someone or come to find me at the last point he saw me. So I will wait here. Otherwise, if I might go in one direction, maybe they went in the other. Radiallahu anha subhanallah, what wisdom. The Sahabi who was appointed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to practice this sunnah, that see if anybody is left behind or anything had been forgotten. What a beautiful sunnah. Practice the sunnah. We left a masjid or left one area or were staying somewhere. Just may take one more look or send someone just to verify. Many a time we'll find that someone forgot something of importance. And we learn this beautiful teaching in the sunnah. Of sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Hazrat Safwan saw Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha. The only thing he said was, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. And nothing else. He knelt down the camel. He went aside. He allowed her to get onto the camel. And then he pulled the reins. No chit chat. No discussion. There was total respect. But they were hypocrites. Who when they arrived at the camp. Started arousing fitan and trials. And Allah revealed Verses of the Quran Kareem in Surah An Nur, liberating our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, proclaiming her innocence and purity, Allahu Akbar, and with her Hazrat Safwan bin Muattal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This was a great Sahabi of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. On one occasion, he was traveling, and he sees this form that was a snakeish form, and he saw this creation of Allah, and he buried this creation of Allah, and afterwards, later on. The other jinn came to him and said, who was the one who buried our companion? He said, what do you mean? They explained that this was his form. He says, yes, I did. They made dua for him and said that was one of the sahaba who met Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the nine, they were one of the jinn who on Allah's Nabi's return from Taif heard him recite the quran Kareem, Allahu Akbar. And they got hidayah through Allah's Nabi's tilawa. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ صرفنا إليك نفرا من الجن يستمعون القرآن فلما حضروه قالوا أنصتوا فلما قضي ولوا إلى قومهم منذرين قالوا يا قومنا I implore one and all see how Allah quotes the jinn where the jinn were telling their comrades and associates, and families. Allah quotes their words, what they narrated to their people, nay, how they invited their people to Allah. They just embraced Islam. Immediately they started inviting to Allah. قَالُوا يَا قَوْمَنَا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا كِتَابًا أُنزِلَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مُوسَى مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدْعِيهِ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْحَقِّ وَإِلَى طَرِيقٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ يَا قَوْمَنَا O oh, our people, O oh, our people, Ajibu da'i Allah, respond to the caller of Allah. They're giving their people dawat, and Quran is telling us. So one of them was this Sahabi, Amr radiallahu anhu, and Hazrat Safwan radiallahu anhu buried him on that occasion. So we learn from here, even Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's journey to Ta'if, but Allah gave hidayah. So when we exert ourselves for Allah, when we strive for Allah, when we invite to Allah, Allah is the giver of hidayah. And we must ask Allah Ta'ala to accept us, to serve His deen and become the means of hidayah. So we digressed at the point of where Allah's Nabi wanted the hidayah of, of humanity. And on occasions he mentioned different, different individuals. And on this occasion, Allah's Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned these four Sahaba, these four men, radiyallahu anhum. So let's never underestimate efforts because Allah is the giver of hidayah. The Sahabi we learn about was of those who Allah's Nabi wanted hidayah for him. He was known as the Khatib of the Quraysh. In the past, 
he was known to be the best, best amongst the Quraysh to actually orate and present their message on their behalf. Zaid bin Musayyab was asked, who is the best of the khutaba of Quraysh in Jahiliyyah? He said, Al-Aswad bin Al-Muttalib and Suhail bin Amr. And then he was asked about Islam, the best khutb, khutb lecturers, orators in Islam. He said, Hazrat Muawiyah radiallahu anhu and his son, namely Yazid, and Sa'id and his son, and Hazrat Abdullah bin Zubayr radiallahu anhum. It's interesting that in Jahiliyyah, there were quite a few who would actually present uh, lectures. And they would have contests for this. Like there were common poets and there were contests in this regard. There were common lecturers and orators. And they would very often use sticks as though they prepare for anything, meaning a staff. Jahid says, in history, the shu'ara were actually loved and revered by the Arabs. And they were needed more because they used to defend the dignity of tribes. But when the shu'ara, the poets increased, then their love and reverence for their orators increased and, they, and their status increased. Interestingly, when the da'wat of Rasulullah sallallahu started in Makkah Mukarramah, Suhail bin Amr received the da'wat with discontempt and disdain, n- not taking effect from it at all. And little did he realize that Allah's Nabi's efforts inspired his own children. He thought it's not possible. He is the orator of Quraysh. But it shocked him that his sons and his daughter, radiallahu anhum, had embraced Islam. And he tried his best to wrench Islam from their hearts. But it had permeated deep, deep into their hearts and their souls. They were prepared to give their life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the deen of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His son, sons were namely Abdullah and the other was Abu Jandal. Abu Jandal's name was Al-As. Anyway, both these sons, when they had embraced Islam, the father had become so upset. He tried by all means to bring them back to the creed of the forefathers, but he refu- they refused. He put them into a dungeon, putting them under torture and suffering. But alhamdulillah, they upheld their iman. At the time of Badr, it was Abdullah, the son of Suhail, who actually then said to his father, you know, my father, maybe I should join you on this trip. He wanted to get out of uh, incarceration and the prison and the cell of his father. So his father felt elated that maybe my son is now thinking you know, in his right sense of mind. Maybe he now wants to really join us. And what happened was, when the mushrikeen had laid in the line before the Muslims, he then ran, ran to the side of the Muslims to join the Muslims in the Battle of Badr. And he then was on the side of the Muslims where his own father Suhail was defeated and was taken as a captive in Badr. As far as the other son, Abu Jandal, he at first was worried, what is Abdullah trying to do? But he then realized the strategy of his brother. And his brother encouraged him to do the same. But he could not muster up the courage to actually stand on the opposite side against his father. So he remained in imprisonment. As far as his daughter is concerned, her name was Sahla bintu Suhail Amiriya radiallahu anha. Sahla. What beautiful meaning to this name. Like Suhail also means someone approachable, someone kind. Sahla means the same. A beautiful Sahabiya name. Suhail also refers to a very bright star in the skies that's apparent to the eye. Anyway, Sahla radiallahu anha became the wife of Hazrat Abu Hudayfa bin Utbah radiallahu anhu. He was also the son of a very senior man of Quraysh. We all know Utbah and Shaiba, one of the seniors who were the seniors of Quraysh. It was Utbah who actually offered Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa grapes when Allah's Nabi was in Ta'if, the famous Utbah. He was then killed in Badr. Anyway, his son was Abu Hudayfa radiallahu anhu. There was another daughter of Suhail's. And her name was Umm Kulthum, radiyallahu anha. Umm Kulthum bin to Suhail. And she was wedded to Hazrat Sabra bin Abi Ruhum, radiyallahu anhu. And the couple in the early Meccan stage to protect the Iman together migrated to Abyssinia for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake of 
the propagation of Allah's deen and for the upliftment of Allah's deen and the preservation of Allah's deen in them and their progenies. So Suhail was really depressed at the fact that his own children could not be halted by him from the truth of Islam, from the beauty of Islam. What a shock it was for him in Badr when his own son ran to the side of the Muslims. But what inspired him greatly was when he was a captive in Badr. Allahu Akbar. The captives of Badr were given wonderful treatment. They had lost in the battle of Badr. They were given a place to stay next to Masjid Nabawi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Said that, that the a'mal of Masjid Nabawi is in proximity of their eyes. So they can see the beauty of deen. Dawat, ta'aleem, learning and teaching. Inviting to Allah. Serving one another. Worshipping Allah. Remembering Allah. The un unity of the Muslims. Of all people of all different backgrounds. Mindsets. Uh, color, race, all people together under deen. Islam is so beautiful that it unites so many people. And the captives were not belittled. They were given wonderful treatment. Sahaba would feed them well. Sahaba would actually serve them and then eat. Sahaba would actually give them the best part of the meal. This shocked the captives amongst them, namely Suhail ibn Amr. Interestingly, the Sahabi who took Suhail ibn Amr into captivity. His name was Malik ibn Dukhshum radiallahu anhu. Suhail tried to escape his captivity until as Hazrat Malik was holding him, Suhail sought permission to go relieve himself. So Malik says, go there and relieve. He says, but I cannot, I, you know, this is shameful for me. You have to move aside. So he allowed him to go a little further. And in this, as Suhail was on his way to relieve himself, he escaped. Hazrat Malik bin Dukhshum announced among the Sahaba عنهم, that whoever finds Suhail ibn Amr Dhul Anyab, the man of the Mawlas, Anyab is a title of one who's very good in oratory skills. And anyway, the Sahaba went looking for him and they found him in one bush, concealing himself. They tied him and brought him to Malik ibn Dukhshum. Anyway, something else interesting is that as Hazrat Zayd bin Haritha عنه, entered Makkah Mukarramah to give the news, that Alhamdulillah the Muslims have defeated the Mushrikeen of Badr and some people are taken as captive. There was a shock and it seems in the reports that no one expected Suhail bin Amr to become a captive. That's why it's reported that Hazrat Usama Radhiran was asking his father Hazrat Zaid, are you sure that Suhail bin Amr is our captive, is a captive in the hands of the Muslims? And Hazrat Zaid reassures his son and his son then goes to give the glad tidings to the Muslims that Alhamdulillah, the Muslims did defeat the Mushrikeen in Badr. There is one incident when Hazrat Sauda anha saw among the captives Suhail bin Amr, such a senior of the Quraysh. The words emanated from her mouth that what kind are you people that you just gave in? Why didn't you all die an honorable death instead of falling as captives? And Hazrat Suda says, just then I realized Allah's Nabi behind me. And Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Suda, are you encouraging people against Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And Hazrat Suda anha immediately realized that she uttered what she was not supposed to utter. And she totally sought pardon. She said, O Nabi of Allah, I just saw the state of someone from Quraysh being so, so senior. And falling into such a plight, I lost control of these words coming out of my mouth. Definitely it is my mistake. Obviously Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted this from her. But we learn from here a lesson from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. That how we have to be wary. What we say must never be something to displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as Suhail was a captive, they obviously spent few days in Medina Manubara before their ransom arrived from Makkah Mukarramah. Amongst the captors were Walid bin Walid. Those few days in Medina and in the, in the environment of the Muslims, the environment of Medina Munawwara, inspired Walid bin Walid so much that when his brother Khalid bin Walid came with the 4,000 dirham, he actually went with his brother but he couldn't bear the environment away from Medina. He then rushed back to Medina to embrace, this, embrace Islam. The individual who came with the ransom money for Suhail bin Amr was none other than Mikraz 
ibn Hafs. He brought the Amman for Suhail bin Amr. But whilst Suhail was in captivity, Hazrat Umar radiallahu sought the permission of Janabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O Nabi of Allah, Da'ani anzi'u thaniyatay Suhail ibn Amr yadla'u lisanuhu fala yaqoomu alayka khatiban fi mawtinin abada. O Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when thought that comes to my mind that I need your permission for, allow me to pull out the front teeth of Suhail bin Amr. Let him have a lisp and a stammer that he'll never be able to stand up against Allah's deen ever again. Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu remembered his fiery lectures wherein he would stand to, to, to turn people away from deen and discourage people from deen and urge the mushrikeen against the Muslims. And it hurt him so much. That's why he sought this permission from Janabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many times he would stand up and speak on behalf of the Quraysh and the Mushrikeen against us. Allow me to sort him out once and forever that he'll be in such a shame that he'll never stand up again. Allahu Akbar. Janabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who wanted hidayat for humanity, who gave an opportunity to every person, saw the goodness in every individual. Allah's Nabi said, Umar, Umar, we are not allowed to mutilate. O oh, Umar, inshaAllah, hopefully, one day, Suhail will take such a stand that will bring joy to you. Nay, it will bring joy to you and humanity. Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanallah, Allah's beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw goodness, saw hope that Suhail bin Amr will get hidayat. Another interaction Suhail had with the beloved of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was on the occasion of Sulh al The beloved of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sees this vision, sees this dream that himself and Sahaba radiallahu anhum are performing Umrah. Allah's beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam announces to the Sahaba that we depart on this journey of Umrah. Together they leave 1400 Sahaba radiallahu anhum. They were few who were new to deen, who were told to come, but they had refused, warring that maybe the Meccans will attack and so forth. They had just, you know, started coming into deen. So, the 1400 Sahaba, anhum, journeyed with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa on this journey. And as they were traveling to Mecca Mukarramah, at one point, the camel of Janabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam halted and sat down. Sahaba were worried, perturbed. What is the reason for this? Is it stubbornness of the camel? Is it the camel is tired? Khala'atil qaswa? Allah's Nabi said, the camel is not stubborn, but actually Allah who halted the elephant, the elephant of Abraha that was charging to demolish Baytullah, Allah halted that elephant, the same Allah caused this camel to halt. And Allah's Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam announced to the Sahaba that we are not here to fight, we are here for Umrah. And whatever peace treaty they offer us, we will give in because we are coming in peace. We are coming for peace. During this journey, Allah's beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took a different route to abstain from any conflict. The spot upon which Allah's Nabi's camel halted is known as Thaniyatul Marar. Then Allah's beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went via an area called Hudaybiyah. They halted at a place and there was need for water. The pond there had dried up. Very little water was left. When there was a complaint presented to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took out his spear and gave it to the Sahabi. Two Sahaba. It's reported that two Sahaba took the spear down. One was Hazrat Najiya bin Jundub radiallahu anhu. The other report says Al-Bara bin Azib radiallahu anhu. So these two Sahaba assisted each other, went down the pond and they placed and the, 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 the spear of Janabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa into the ground. And water came out gushing from the spear of Janabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah's Nabi then placed his hand and it's reported that water came out gushing from the hand Mubarak of Janabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa What blessed water. The best of water. Imagine the fortune of Sahaba who drank water emanating from the Mubarak hands of Janabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whilst the Muslims were camped there. Now this became the camp of the Muslims at Hudaybiyah. Salahs took place there. A'mal took place there. Mashuras were daily taking place there. That what's the next move? 
when the Meccans had sent emissaries to speak on behalf of the Mushrikeen of Makkah, telling the Muslims to return and that they would never be allowed to enter Makkah. All these negotiations took place here. Whoever came on behalf of the Mushrikeen met the Muslims here and was given an opportunity to see the beauty of Islam. When Budail bin Warqa came, he was welcome. When Mikras bin Hafs came, he was also welcome. A man from Kinana, Hulais bin al -Qamah. These are people sent on behalf of the Mushrikeen of Makkah to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to explain the actual reason of the arrival of Janabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And every one of them who came to the Muslims were given an opportunity to see the beauty of Islam. Allah's Nabi would say to Sahaba that such and such person is coming. He has an affinity to animals. Show them the beautiful treatment of Muslims in regards to animals, for example. And while that individual would be there, it would be the time of Salah. Adhan would take place. Salah wa Jamaat is taking place. Whatever Amal is taking place. Whatever Ikram is taking place. All this was seen by them. One of the individuals that came was Urwa bin Mas'ud al-Thaqafi. This was prior to his Islam. He was a senior man from the people of Taif. And he actually saw Sahaba's love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in that, that they didn't even want the water of his wudu, meaning his wudu. Wudu is the practice that we do of wudu, our ablution. And wudu, with a fatha on the wow, is the water that is used for wudu. He saw how Sahaba loved the wudu of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they would drink it and apply it and respect it and benefit from it because it's from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He goes to his people in Makkah and he says to them, I've been in delegations to kings of the world. I've not seen a people love their king, their leader, like the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam love the beloved of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ma ra'aytu ahadan yuhibbu ahadan ka hubbi ashabi muhammadin muhammada. The details of this event in history, Sulh al is mentioned in Surah Al-Fatih of the Qur'an Kareem, chapter 48 of the Qur'an Kareem. There's one incident that mentions how one group of 80 of the mushrikeen came to attack the Muslims. And Allah gave victory to Rasulullah and the Sahaba over this group of 80 people. And Allah's Nabi showed them kindness and allowed them to go free. Allah is that being who withheld their hands from you, meaning Allah didn't allow them to defeat you. And Allah withheld your hands from them, meaning Allah gave you tawfiq to treat them well. After Allah gave you victory over them in the valley of Makkah, meaning Hudaybiyah. Then Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made mashura with sahaba radiyallahu anhum. Let's send someone into Makkah to speak to them in their proximity on our behalf. When Allah's Nabi asked the Rai of Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, O Nabi of Allah, send Hazrat Uthman bin Affan. Why? He comes from a very noble tribe, a tribe respected by the Quraysh. He comes from the Banu Umayyah. And also, we learn from this, in, from this report, we learn from this scenario that Hazrat Uthman was very prominent and very well to do. Subhanallah, we learn from here the wisdom of Janabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Propagate Allah's deen and wisdom that Sahaba would utilize the position Allah gave them and the, the, the status Allah gave them for humanity to be convinced towards the truth. If Allah gave you status, gave you wealth, gave one position, gave one respect, that is not for free. This is the test. Will we use it for Allah's sake or Allah forgive us we just use it for our coffers or our contacts or for some monetary gain. If we do not realize that it is a test and to be used for Allah's deen, then we are failing this test. Hazrat Uthman enters. He was welcomed by the people of Makkah. They treated him well. They were astonished at the way his libas was, sunnat libas. His kurta was half the shin. Anyway, he was, wel he was welcome in their parliament. They asked him the reason for his arrival. He mentioned why the Muslims had come and then they offered him. They offered him, you can benefit from the Kaaba while you wait, await our reply. Imagine the response of Hazrat Uthman. He said, how can I circumambulate the Kaaba and perform tawaf and enjoy 
the proximity of the Kaaba without my beloved sallallahu alayhi wasallam. No, I will do some other work, but I will not be able to perform tawaf. And interestingly, at the same time, it so happened that Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam overheard a few say, how fortunate is Uthman that during this time he has the Kaaba to himself. Allah's Nabi said to them that I know my Uthman. He will never perform tawaf until he goes with his beloved sallallahu alayhi wasallam. What were other tasks of Hazrat Uthman in Makkah? He was to go visit the weak, oppressed Muslims, those who were suffering difficulty and tyranny at the hands of the Mushrikeen of Makkah. He was to visit them and reassure them and encourage them and inspire them and give them the good news of Allah's help that will be arriving soon. And another duty that Hazrat Uthman was given, that, O oh, Uthman, give every person you meet dawat. Give da'wah to Allah. And this is a clear injunction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to Hazrat Uthman as he was going into Makkah. He is going to negotiate on behalf of the Muslims. But Allah's Nabi in his guidelines to Hazrat Uthman, Allah's Nabi says to him, you give them da'wah. So we learn from here, the duty of every Muslim is har hal me in every condition, in every situation, taking every opportunity, invite to Allah. We are not saying force, but invite, make deen available. And explain, we are not forcing you, but we are showing you how beautiful is this deen. Why are you showing us? Because it is our duty and it is your right that you know the truth. And we can even say further, that don't say tomorrow on the day of judgment to the Lord Almighty that I didn't tell you that I didn't notify you. So these are wise points through which we'll be able to imprint their hearts and affect them. That inshallah, even when they're going to sleep, they'll think that the person told us, Allah give us the faith to fulfill this duty, like Sahaba radiallahu anhu. When rumors spread that Hazrat Uthman had been assassinated, Allah's Nabi gathered Sahaba for bay'ah. The first Sahabi was Hazrat Abu Sinan to take the bay'ah. Hazrat Salama bin Akwa took bay'ah three times. And alhamdulillah, Afterwards, the news became clear that Hazrat Uthman was not Shaheed. He was just waiting for their response and he was in Makkah fulfilling his duties. Then the Meccans sent a man by the name of Suhail bin Amr as he was arriving from a distance when Allah's Nabi saw him. In the camp, Allah's Nabi said to Sahaba that they want peace and a treaty when they had sent this man because he was the negotiator of Quraysh. And Allah's Nabi deduced this from his name. His name means easygoing, calm, approachable. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa taught us to be positive always and never be negative about matters. But take a positivity out of every negativity. Whatever the situation, be positive and there is goodness. Find the goodness in it and carry on realizing that every condition comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Suhail finally came, deen was showed to him. He was afforded the opportunity to see what is going on concerning the deen of Allah and how united are Muslims of all different, different backgrounds. Finally, they came to the agreement and the document was to be drawn up and Allah's Nabi then dictates to Hazrat Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu to write the clause of the treaty. Among the clause was ceasefire for 10 years, no more war. This was wonderful because this afforded the Muslims an opportunity to interact with the people. Another clause was no Umrah this year. This was hurtful for the Muslims, but Allah's Nabi said, okay, we give in to that as well. Another point that came up was anyone from Makkah, meaning Muslim, who wants to leave Makkah and come to Medina, the Medinan Muslims, the Muslims of Medina cannot welcome him. Any male. And if anyone from Medina wants to leave Medina and go to Makkah, the Meccans are at liberty to welcome him. Allah's Nabi then dictated, saying that this is an agreement between Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so he then stopped the Nabi of Allah saying, that why are you writing Muhammad Rasulullah in the document? We don't allow this. I don't accept you as Rasulullah. Allah's Nabi, the greatest of Allah's creation. And he is being told this by Suhail. Imagine, Allah's Nabi, Sahaba was shocked. Allah's Nabi said to Ali, wipe out Rasulullah. Hazrat Ali was emotioned by this. He said, never. 
Allah's Nabi then himself removed Rasulullah and said to Hazrat Ali that Muhammad bin Abdullah, right there, Muhammad the son of Abdullah. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was teaching Sahaba how we have to forego and if that will bring people closer to Allah's deen, how much of khair Allah will take out of it. But before the document was signed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa a man arrives, he was bleeding, he was he had gone through torture. He had just escaped a dungeon wherein he was locked up for years. And he said to the Muslims, rescue me, save me. Allah's Nabi said, just give me this one individual. Yes, it's part of the clause that none from Mecca can be welcome in Medina. This is the only individual that I personally intercede for. Give him to me. And yes, we sign the document and everything as normal. So Hale says, never. If you do not uphold it here, that means there's no agreement, there's no truce, there's no peace. Allah's Nabi actually then said, please, Suhail, just this one. And Suhail refused. What would happen for us to realize that the individual who came out of torture and was in his shackles with blood smeared all over him, he was none other than Abu Jandal, the son of Suhail. This is the beloved of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa speaking for Suhail's own son. But Suhail refused. And Abu Jandal radiallahu anhu in tears. But Allah's Nabi said to him that soon Allah's help is coming. Because now because of the truth, the Meccans were not allowed to ill-treat the people like this anymore. Allah's Nabi reassured him of Allah's assistance coming soon. As the Muslims were returning, they were heartbroken. They felt we're coming for Umrah and we're not performing Umrah. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sees the grief of Sahaba. He makes mashura with his wife, Umm al-Mu'mineen, Hazrat Umm Salama radiallahu anha. She says, O Nabi of Allah, you just do what's the right thing and Sahaba will emulate you. It's just that they're going through so much of emotion. Allah's Nabi removed his baal, Mubarak, and Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa performed his ritual, sacrificed the animal and departed. And all the Sahaba did the same. And as they were returning, Allah revealed the verses of Qur'an, Inna fatahna lak, Inna fatahna lak fatham mubi'ina liyaghfira lak Allahu ma taqaddama min dhambika wa ma taakhar wa yutimma ni'matahu alayka wa yahdiyaka siratam mustaqima. Allahu Akbar. Allah says, we've granted you a clear victory, an open victory. Sahaba asking, is this a victory? Is this a victory? Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu would always explain what a victory was Sulhul Hudaybiyah. What a victory was Sulhul Hudaybiyah. Muslims were returning hurt that we're not performing Umrah. Hazrat Abu Bakr explained to them, Allah's Nabi told you we'll perform Umrah, isn't They said, yes. Hazrat Abu Bakr told them, we will perform Umrah, but Allah's Nabi didn't say when, yes you will perform Umrah. Hazrat Abu Bakr explains how Sulhul Hudaybiyah was such a victory. Muslims returned numbering 1400. Coming to Makkah on this occasion, it was Dhul Qada 6th year, 1400. Few other hundred more Muslims, um, you know, approximately in Medina. Beside that, couple of thousand women and children, two or three thousand. But two years later, Allahu Akbar, in this period where the truce had taken place, so much of Hidayat spread, so much of Hidayat spread, when Makkah was being conquered two years later, 10,000 Sahaba marched to Makkah Mukarramah with Janabi Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Up till Sulhul Hudaybiyah, 19 years of effort and 1400 Sahaba by the side of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on this occasion. And in the short span, where the Meccans and the Mushrikeen and the people had interaction with the Muslims. They would buy from them, sell from them. They would have interaction. They would have deals. They would have discussions. And in every discussion, they would see the akhlaq of Sahaba, the interaction of Sahaba, how Islam had refined these same people that the Meccans knew from before. And Sahaba, Allahu Akbar, were the wisest of all. They never left an opportunity to Im invite to Allah. And in the short span, more hidayat spread 
than the prior 19 years. That's why Hazrat Abu Bakr explained that Sulhul Hudaybiyah, that the same Suhail bin Amr on that occasion who refused to write Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on Hajjatul Wada'a, he was making khidmat of Janabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and bringing the camel of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he picked up the Baal Mubarak of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he placed it in his eyes. Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu says, and I would remember Remember the day I was next to the beloved of Allah and he even refused to write Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah's Nabi showed so much of akhlaq, so much of akhlaq. How much are we prepared to tolerate people, to allow them an opportunity to understand the beauty of Islam? We cannot expect people just to change overnight, but we have to continuously work on humanity like Sahaba Radiallahu did, like Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Allah give us tawfiq.